All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to the new pre-Raphaelites. Yay, six o'clock. Um, so I thought I'd just start it. Um, very, very excited to be here with you guys presenting this exhibition and um, it's gonna be a really, really exciting show. Um, I am just gonna stop sharing the screen for a second um, so that we can um, uh, see our speakers up close. Um, it's, it's an amazing show. It came together so wonderfully and I'm just so excited about it. So it's gonna be great. Um, so welcome everyone to the new pre raphaelites Illumination. So my name is Jessica Libor and I am the director of um, the Era Contemporary Gallery. And I am here with the curator of the show, um, Kerry Dunn. Uh, Kerry, are you here to say hello? You may not have logged on yet. Um, if I am, I'm here. Oh, hello. <laughs> how are you? I'm good, how are you? Happy to be here. Awesome, happy good you're here too. As always. Yes, very cool hat. Um, so Kerry is our esteemed curator and I will tell you more about him uh, a little bit later, but um, yeah. Uh, and Kerry Dunn curated the exhibition. And then Molly Giordano, who is the director of the Delaware Art Museum, which houses the largest collection of pre raphaelite art in the United States. Um, she is here as well. And I, I think I saw her in the Zoom chat. Are you, are you here, Molly? I'm here. Hi, Jessica. It's great to Hi. see everyone. Yes, great to see you too. Very cool. Um, okay, so along with us are many of the artists exhibiting this evening who will have a chance to speak about their work, which is what I'm really looking forward to this evening. And um, just a few notes about the structure of the show. So I'm just gonna speak, speak briefly about the inspiration for the ex exhibition. And then Molly uh, will say a few words about the original Pre-Raphaelites. And then the curator for the exhibition, Carrie Dunn will say a few words about his um, curation experience with us, and then, um, and then we will uh, we will begin the virtual tour of the exhibition and have the artists speak about their work. Elaine Sahar. Oh. The, um, oh, could you please put yourself on mute? Um, thank you so much. I'm sorry. Yes, <laughs> that'd be great. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, yeah, anybody entering the chat, if you could just um, mute yourself, that would be amazing. And um, yeah, if you're an artist, of course, you'll have a chance to speak. And if you have any questions during the course of this entire exhibition, um, please put that in the chat, because um, I'll be checking the chat periodically during um, tonight's exhibition. And um, if you have any questions for any of the artists, um, we'll, we'll you know try to answer them. So just a note about the structure of the show. So I'm going to um, speak, then Molly will speak, and then Carrie will speak, and then we'll begin the virtual tour of the exhibition, have the artists speak about their work. And during the entire show, um, yes, we ask the guests stay muted, but if you have a question, type in the chat and we'll be able to see it there and answer you. And just a note that tonight at midnight is the deadline for you to purchase many of the artworks at a special price. So some artists have elected um, for a special price for their work for any collector who purchases before midnight tonight. And all of the works are for sale and you can see the collection and buy it directly on the website. And that is, um, the link for that is actually in the chat. So you can actually click on that right from the chat to see all the works and buy them directly. So now in its second year, the new pre raphaelites is a group exhibition organized by Eric Contemporary Gallery. And this year um, we added illumination to inspire artists to interpret their contemporary vision of the original pre raphaelites So illumination has many meanings, but for this exhibition, the artists interpret the word illumination as it inspires their work. An illumination may refer to the awakening of one's own personal insights, a spiritual transformation, or a historical reference to the illuminated manuscripts found in ancient holy texts during the medieval dark ages, spanning from 400 to 1400 BC. These ideas were also used as inspiration by the original Pre-Raphaelites, 
who were a self-titled group of English artists during the mid 1800s to the early 1900s that wanted to paint the natural world and heartfelt stories that included myth, legend, magic, and faith. This is the second iteration of the new Pre-Raphaelites exhibitions hosted by Eric Contemporary Gallery. And illumination in art history originally refers to the use of gold or silver leaf to embellish a page in a book so that the words literally appear illuminated by changing light. The practice usually involved the painting um, in brilliant colors, elaborate designs, and lots of miniature illustrations. And the work for this show may refer to a sudden burst of creativity or inspiration, a decision in life that leads to great insight, a transformative experience, and also the aesthetic choices that embrace gold leaf and a glowing spiritual or magical imagery, which is really cool. Um, so that is a little bit about the inspiration for the show. And I will say that the artists really blew me away. Um, and I'm just so excited to be a part of this show. And um, I can't wait to hear from you all. Now, um, Molly, um, I would, you know, everyone is really looking forward to just um, hearing you. And um, yeah, anything you would like to say about the show, about the original pre raphaelites um, yeah, um, you, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. First off, can you hear me okay? Because I was having some microphone problems. Okay, yes. fantastic. Uh, well, hi, everyone. As Jessica said, I'm Molly Giordano. I'm the executive director of the Delaware Art Museum. I think many of you are in the Philadelphia region. We are located in Wilmington, Delaware, which is about 30 minutes uh, south from Philly. And in uh, at the end of my, um, end of my talk, I'll draw more about the museum's pre-Raphaelite collection. Um, but we've been around, the museum was founded in 1912, and we have the largest collection of pre-Raphaelite art outside of the UK. Um, and the collection came to us through a generous donor, a, a Quaker textile mill owner who operated a very large textile mill on the Brandywine River. And he collected pre-Raphaelite art at the end of the 1800s into the early 1900s. Uh, long before it was fashionable to do so. And he amassed a quite significant collection and then bequeathed the collection to us and the land to build our museum under the stipulation that we would forever house the pre-Raphaelites as sort of the crown jewel collection of our museum. If you haven't been, it's an incredible experience. We have people come from all over the world, especially the UK to see our pre-Raphaelite collection. We just reinstalled it um, after after about a 10, 12 years in the same gallery space, our wonderful curator, Dr. Margareta Frederick, uh, reinstalled the entire collection over the summer and it opened on July 31st of 2021. So I invite you all to come in and check out that exhibition. We're open for free Thursday evenings and every Sunday. And um, I know you all uh, enjoy the installation as much as we do. Uh, just a couple comments about today's show. We connected with Jessica through one of our trustees who met Jessica at one of your uh, art fairs, I believe. And we were so thrilled to learn about this exhibition because we are constantly trying to find new ways to make the pre-Raphaelite um, brotherhood and, and the pre-Raphaelite movement applicable to today's audiences, drawing those parallels. And one of the things we did in our reinstallation, um, we interviewed a hundred local community members and asked them, what do you care about? What questions do you have? They had so many questions about the pre-Raphaelites. They wanted to know about the thematic subject nature. They wanted to know about the themes of morality. They wanted to understand why this group of artists in the mid 1800s tried to break away from the academy and what they were really trying to achieve. They especially wanted to understand the themes of nature, the uh, idea that they were sort of revolting against the industrial revolution and environmental degradation of their time. And a lot of these issues are still core to our society's concerns, the environment, uh, issues of sort of women, uh, issues of morality. These are things that artists continue to grapple with. And we're just so excited to see a group of artists that is reflecting on some themes of the pre-Raphaelites drawing inspiration from them. I think there's uh, so much we can learn and I'm just so grateful to have a chance to speak with you and so thankful that the pre-Raphaelite, uh, the artists of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood continue to resonate today. The last thing I'll say is that where our collection is headed into the future is for the past 10 to 15 years, um, Margareta and our curatorial team 
has really been focused on telling the undertold narratives of uh, pre-Raphaelite art. They have been doing solo uh, female pre-Raphaelite exhibitions, trying to highlight some of those female artists that have sort of been left out of the art historical canon, telling the underrepresented stories of some of the models and artists of color that were part of that movement. And one of my favorite parts of the new installation is a, a corner of one of the galleries where they're sort of an examining the female models through the male gaze and what does that mean and how we can sort of free some of these models from that male gaze. So there's so much uh, rich content left to explore in this collection. We continue to purchase works by pre-Raphaelite artists and add them to our collection. And I invite you all to come down and, and see the show. And when you're there, I'll drop my email in the chat. You're welcome to email me and I'd love to uh, say a quick hello. So uh, Jessica, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. Wow, that, that's so amazing. I love hearing about how you guys came, came about you know, getting all that amazing artwork because it is mostly, you know, based in England. And so it's cool to hear that a collector here in the United States um, was able to amass such like a treasure trove of these very specific um, aesthetic of these artists. And, um, you know, it's here for all of us to enjoy. So uh, the original pre-Raphaelites um, are just such an, a magical, um, just a, an amazing, um, group of artists to study and to see. And I have been to the collection at the Delaware Art Museum and seen it in person. And um, it is really just stunning. And um, I'm thinking of a few pieces in particular. And um, yeah, it's definitely worth a visit. So um, yes, uh, thank you so much, Molly. And um, the link is in the chat for any of you who want to check out um, the Delaware Art Museum as well. Okay. And um, so next, thank you so much, Molly. We so appreciate that. And um, Yes, next, um, we're going to hear a little bit from Kerry Dunn, who um, curated this entire exhibition, um, this contemporary exhibition. And uh, before I turn it over to Kerry, a little bit about Kerry. So um, Kerry is part of a movement of new masters that has sought to reclaim the methodologies of the old masters, almost completely lost during the 20th century. And this movement is in large part due to the atelier system, which is small studio schools, each led by a master painter that have been on the rise since the mid nineties around the world. Studio in Caminati in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, United States is one of these such schools where Kerry studied between 2003 to 2008 with renowned portrait painter, Nelson Shanks. And Kerry now teaches at the school, but he doesn't just teach. Um, Kerry's work is firmly rooted in the academic traditions of painting from life um, as practiced by the old masters. Kerry feels most drawn to the art of portrait painting, where characters are cast on, on a stage and narrative is inevitable. And of course, the ever elusive challenge of creating a master work, which we are all after as artists, right? Uh, so, so that is Carrie Dunn and Carrie has won many national prizes and international prizes as well. So we are just so grateful to have him here um, involved in the show and, and you know, selecting the works from, the, um, from everything that was submitted. So Carrie, um, is there anything you would like to tell us about anything, you know, the pre-Raphaelites, the uh, process of curation, your thoughts about the show. Sure, thank you for having me. Um, am I coming in through okay? Yes. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm in an Airbnb in Miami, so I, I have no idea. Uh, um, well, so, I mean, Jessica and I have collaborated on a, on a couple projects and um, she asked if I would be interested in curating a show for her gallery. Uh, and of course I said I would love to. Um, um, she said, well, how about we do something on the pre-Raphaelites because that's something very uh, near and dear to her heart. Um, I said, yes, absolutely, let's do it. Um, my, my real connection to the pre-Raphaelites comes through the, the technical um, you know, process of painting. And, and you know, uh, we did a podcast about a week ago on, on this subject. And um, you know, some of the, a few of the pieces from that movement, they're just very technically wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, Ophelia, right, where she's like floating in the water, um, uh, it comes to mind. Um, so that's certainly like my connection to to the movement. And then as as the as the this show sort of uh, began to come together, uh, I of course tried to educate myself on it a bit more. 
um, began learning more about it. And one thing I, I kind of dawned on me is that the pre-Raphaelite aesthetic seems like a pretty enduring aesthetic. I think it's something that people still feel um, drawn to, um, you know, and I was trying to sort of pick it apart a little bit, you know, why that might be, but it's definitely a combination of, uh, you know, certainly the beautiful imagery, um, sort of like the, you know, these stories and myths that kind of uh, ex um, um, exist in the imagination. Um, very beautiful images um, to, to look at. They were very much into color, very much into like, these decorative elements. Um, they were, they were. I mean, I, I have no authority on this subject at all, but um, just what little I do know. Uh, and, and I know that they were sort of influenced by uh, biblical narrative uh, imagery, sort of like the spiritual purity. So, you know, I mean, so much of our art today is like shock and crudeness and, um, um, pessimism and so I think it kind of offers something and you know and this you know offers something different I guess for us to kind of um, if we appreciate um, something in that aesthetic I think is, is still resonating um, so and it was kind of interesting also uh, just now talking about the male gaze because it's true that there is a lot of imagery from this period that's kind of the male gaze and I think that's very appropriate for this to come up during our time, you know, whereas during their time it reflects, there's a subway going by my apartment, um, <laughs> and it reflects, you know, where their, the culture was at at that point in time. And so, you know, and it's, it's this kind of, you know, the pre raphaelite aesthetic and philosophy it could almost be reimagined. I kind of feel like we're just scratching the surface a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just a few of my few of my initial thoughts, and then the process. Um, Jessica helped me out some with this with the process of of sort of selecting imagery, and I had no idea what to expect, and I was um, uh, very surprised right off the bat by the high quality of the work, um, and um, that was that part was great. So that just made it all a real pleasure uh, to sort of pull it all together. It made it made it just yeah very pleasurable just because of the high quality. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yes. Um, awesome. Thank you for, thank you for your thoughts on that, Carrie. Sure. And um, yeah, it was great uh, working on it with you. And it's, it's interesting that you bring up um, the male gaze as well, because you're a man. <laughs> um, and then also um, it makes me think of one of my pieces in this show um, is like primarily of um, a male, um, but it's painted in such a way that um, is traditionally actually um, like you would expect a female to like be presented in that way. So um, we'll get to it, but um, yeah, it's, it's gonna be a really great show. All right, so thank you so much, Carrie. Um, that was awesome. And Carrie might be interjecting throughout um, as we kind of present all the work and the artists speak about their work. Um, Carrie might add some thoughts to that. So thank you. I'd for love that. to hear Molly's thoughts too, anytime she wants to jump in. Yes. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And I do. So sorry. I do have to add, I have two kids under five and this is like <laughs> bedtime bath time. So I don't know how long I'll stay, but I'll stay as long as I can manage. Okay. Thank you, Molly. I appreciate that. All right. Great. Well then let's get to it. Um, and I am going to um, launch the show and um, we have some really cool technology here. Um, I'm using um, virtual reality technology. It just takes a moment to load and then we'll be able to dive in and you can just pretend like you're in a real gallery. So here we go. The works are so good. It's, 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 it's good. This will be nice. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, here is the, the new pre-Raphaelites loading because it's a big show guys thank you for all your submissions all right so um let's see here first up we have adina yoon um and adina has these amazing um duos of pieces and um this one i believe is um radiance 
um, or no, this one is Illuminations oil on panel nine by 12 inches. So um, Adina, I, I saw you here. So um, yeah, the floor is yours. Awesome, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, thanks. Um, thanks, Jessica, for this um, great introduction. And um, it's great to meet everybody here on the show. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'll just get to it. Um, I've writ written like a short um, excerpt behind like the thoughts and meanings to um, both of my pieces because I find it easier to convey my thoughts um, through writing. So um, this piece in particular, Radiance, I'm sorry, um, Illumination, represents to me like a new beginning and a fresh perspective on my art practice. Like the white phoenix rising from the ashes of old situations, this painting represents the rekindling of that initial spark and joy of creating. The volcanoes in the back and the process of creating as it explodes and bursts into a new idea or new direction. This painting explores that inner journey of the artist. This painting explores that inner journey of the artist that most times in order to create something new or to follow an illuminated revelation, you must cut ties and even destroy the old world that you knew. The Phoenix reminds us that this is no, there's no creation without destruction and there's no destruction without initial creation. So I'm trying to kind of, um, seek a balance between those two and kind of find a meaning between um, these this explores um, that and celebrates the dance of life um, and death and eventual rebirth of the creative process and the continual evolution of um, the artist herself which is me so that's also kind of like the meaning for the second piece um, as well as these um, are both a pair and I just really loved um, the symbology and mythology of the phoenix, and that's something that I really relate to. And um, yeah, all right, awesome. I think that you broke up a little bit there at the end, but um, but oh, sorry. I, yeah, no, it's, it's not your fault. It's just you know doing a Zoom exhibition. <laughs> um, so so yeah, these are amazing. Thank you so much, Adina. Awesome. All right, so next we have um, Elaine Sehar. Elaine, I saw you here. The floor is yours. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to let, I, I have a little couple of sentences explaining this particular painting, but I wanted to just back up for a minute and just say that my painting is about exploring femininity through the lens of the four elements of fire, water, earth, and air. And there's been a lot of talk about the male gaze. So my, my paintings are about really the, the female gaze, if you will, of feminine, divine femininity, femininity as seen through the four elements. And I also like to sometimes incorporate a little symbolism of sacred geometry. And in this particular painting, I'm using the circle in the background. The title of the painting is called The, Guide, is called the Guiding Light. So I just wanted to take a minute and, and read a thought or two um, from a book on sacred geometry talking about why I chose the symbolism of the circle. And uh, the circle embodies the unity of consciousness, creativity and manifestation and has been connected to the sacred wells of ancient mythologies. Since the circle is the most harmonious of all of the shapes, it also symbolizes regeneration and the healing power of nature. So I think that speaks to a lot of what I'm trying to say in all of my paintings, not just this one. This one, of course, is an example of the earth element and the two women connecting in their, in, in their power, in their own individual divine power, with this orb or this guiding light behind them. So that's really all I wanted to say about my, my painting, Jessica. Awesome, thank you so much, Elaine. And this one is 14 by 21 inches watercolor on paper. Amazing, thank you so much. All right, so next we have this um, stunning painting by Alexandra Katargina. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, Alexandra, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Can you 
Yes, can you hear me? Yes, and we can hear you. All right, so my name is Alexandra Katargina, and I'm very happy to be a part of this diverse exhibit. Um, <clears throat> I would like to talk a little bit about my painting, Soul Awakening. And there are a few different facets that describe the meaning behind this painting. One of them, the most important one is light, which uh, both the outside light of the universe and also the inner or, uh, light of the individual. It symbolizes knowing one's purpose and knowing oneself and kind of fulfilling one's full potential, mm. so to speak. So um, the second basically element is the nocturnal landscape, which is um, kind of symbolizes, I think that in order to find oneself, you have to be like in solitude and in nature and the stillness and quiet of the night is the best possible kind of scenario to find your own true path. And also I think that without darkness, you can never find the light and the shining beacon that's gonna guide you like a compass through life in general and your own personal path. And then um, the last element of this painting are the mocks, which are attracted to light. And they symbolize basically and, uh, that you have to step away from the beaten path to find your own way. And in order to do that, you might get burned just like a moth uh, to a light. And um, basically you have to shed all the social constructs that you have picked up throughout adolescence and so on. You have to abandon other people's expectations and possibly hopes in order to find your own true meaning to life and your own personal gift from the universe and share it with the rest of the world. And this is basically the mom moment that is depicted in this painting. So yeah. Wow, that was so beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, yeah, I can really see that. Thank you so much. All right, um, and this is uh, 29 by 37 inches, oil on ACM panel. And can you tell us what ACM panel is? So it's an aluminum compound panel and it's more uh, stable compared to wooden panel because it doesn't warp. And so it's more, um, you know, it's uh, archival basically. Ah, or oil okay, paintings. great. And um, we have a question in the chat. Is this a self-portrait? Uh, no, no, it's um, a friend. Oh, okay, nice. Um, okay, thank you so much, Alexandra. Beautiful work. Thank you. All right, so next we have, um, right here we have Anna Sanchez, um, Into the Woods, oil on panel, 30 by 30 inches. Anna, are you here? All right, well then I will read, um, I'm going to read out what she described this as. Um, it's very beautiful what she described it as. Okay, so Into the Woods by Anna Sanchez is a unique work, 30 by 30 inches, oil on panel. Um, and this piece, and this is her speaking, this piece is inspired by the very last minutes of the day as well as life. The woman is wearing a Victorian morning gown and is bathed in golden hour shine, about to disappear into the forest. I imagine life as a walk through the path of light. Um, and I think the painting reflects that nostalgia you feel when the light of someone you love or your own is fading, though giving the soul one last sparkle before fading into night. This painting is all about light, light life and the illumination of the soul, which is why I considered it a perfect match for the show. It was painted with a constant reference to the pre-Raphaelites. I even used traditional gesso and the classical techniques for it. And it's my wish that it shows the magical energy of the end of the day or life or light itself, like a fairy tale we make part of. So that is the inspiration for Anna um, for this beautiful piece. All right, so next we have Ariane. Ariane Camps, are you here? I see you. <laughs> there we go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so this piece, um, by the way, I'm a Canadian artist. I'm on the west coast of Canada. So unfortunately, I won't get to the Delaware Museum, but it sounds like a lovely show. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so I began this piece as an experiment. At the time I painted it, I was um, taking some, learning some techniques from Ali Cavanaugh, who is a very unconventional watercolor artist. And um, so this was essentially an experiment. And um, so this is a watercolor on board. And it's very much like painting on glass. Um, but uh, this is a painting of my daughter. Her name is Clover um, from a few years back. And um, there was always something about this piece that felt very familiar. And it actually wasn't until I um, started looking to apply to this show that I realized it reminded me of um, Rossetti's Lady Lilith. And she's brushing her long red hair. Um, however, <laughs> she's, she looks a little gloomy, maybe a little grumpy. I don't know, maybe it was a Monday and she wasn't feeling feeling into it, but um, I think that her posture sort of is um, contrasted in the, in, um, with my daughter's posture because she's very light. I felt like she, her spirit is illuminated almost with like a childlike wonder and innocence. And um, whereas, Rosetti's Lady Lilith is, you know, brushing her hair and looking very uh, consternated almost. Um, my daughter is flicking her hair in a careless sort of way. And I love the way the light was catching her hair in that moment and just her, her levity felt very illuminated to me. And it was interesting um, realizing how deeply the pre-Raphaelite paintings had permeated themselves into my mind because I'd taken lots of pictures of my children, but this was the one I chose to paint. And I think it's because my mother always had pre-Raphaelite paintings around my, my home as a child. And somewhere this painting was in my mind. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting how much art is on a subconscious level with you all the time and those that's that's really where this painting came from for me amazing thank you for sharing beautiful and we have a couple comments um a mona lisa smile um beautiful and reflects a child's evolving self-consciousness yes that's very cool love it um, my sister just my sister just had a baby and um, he's like a month old and it's amazing like watching him develop like even day by day. So um, yeah, I love it. Very oh, yeah. cool. Thank you. Thank you, Ariane. All right. So next we have Brian Willette, the night caller. Um, Brian, are you here? All right. Well, Brian does have a little statement for us, um, which I will read. Okay. He said, um, this is um, called the night collar. It is 11 inches by 15 inches and it's a ready to hang work. And um, in the words of the artist, his inspiration for this piece, um, stained glass is by its very nature illuminated. The pre-Raphaelite artists such as Vern Jones commonly use stained glass as a medium. So this is all hand done stained glass. Um, if you look on the website, you'll see um, it comes with like a chain to hang it. And so it's all ready to go. Um, and uh, yeah, the night color, very cool. All right, so next we have um, Benjamin Shambach and Benjamin um, could not join us today, but these are his beautiful works. He has two works in the show um, and um, Benjamin has this to say about his first work. So Crystal Bowl is an original oil on copper framed piece by Benjamin Shambach and is 15 inches by 21 inches. And his, his um, inspiration for this piece, he says, this painting is about the interaction between the day lilies and the crystal. 
the deep details and the distortions of the crystal contain all the other elements of the painting, the bowl containing the light of the rest of the scene. So that is what he says about this piece. And the Pre-Raphaelites loved beautiful objects and flowers and just anything luscious like this. So it definitely ties in. And so this is the next piece by Benjamin, um, cake with striped paper, oil on copper, 15 inches by 23 inches. And he says about this, a good painting can be simultaneously precious and disposable, searingly truthful and a profound impossibility. I intend for my paintings to be all of these things. And uh, yeah, so this is his, his other piece. Thank you, Benjamin. All right, so next we have two pieces by Brenda Robson. And Brenda, I did see you here, so. Um, Yes, I see you. Um, the floor is yours. You can tell us about the young King Midas. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Jessica and Carrie. I'm so honored to be here. I have two narrative figurative paintings in the show, and both the models are students that we posed in art class at the Cambridge School of Dallas, which is a classical art school, or a classical school where I teach AP art. So I really love painting my students. They are just so wonderful. Uh, this is King Midas, which is a famous Greek myth that served as a cautionary tale about greed. And we all know that King Midas' greatest desire was to be rich and to be able to turn anything he touched into gold. But he's condemned to loneliness and he pays a tragic price when he touches the one that he loves above all others, his daughter, and turns her into a gold statue. So I kind of wanted to capture the resignation in his eyes when he realizes uh, he's become a slave to his own desires and he lost the happiness that he took for granted. So he's going to be very lonely. <laughs> you know what? I just noticed something about his hands. Are his hands meant to be gold? Yes, he's, uh, we, we dipped his hands in gold and we put glitter on them and, and photographed him. And yes, it's sort of a... Uh... Wow. Wow, I thought that... Um you know, when I was like, you know, putting this show up, I, I thought it was more about like the illumination of light on him. But mm -hmm. now that I'm looking at it here, like in the gallery, like, wait, his hands are like gold. <laughs> Very cool. Well, he sort of cursed himself. So, yeah. right. Yeah. And okay. the, uh, the second piece is young Medusa. And so we all know the story of Medusa. Her face was so hideous that the mere sight of her turned the viewer to stone. But the backstory that was that Medusa was actually so beautiful that she was bullied by her sisters. And so I tried to foreshadow a young Medusa bearing the burden of her beauty with a shadow, an actual shadow cast on her face as she holds the mirror. Mm -hmm. um, according to the myth, which you may not know, the sea god Poseidon took her against her will and impregnated her. And then the goddess Athena became so enraged that she cursed Medusa by making her face hideous and transformed her braids into coils. So these were, you know, narratives and I love painting narratives like the Pre-Raphaelites and yeah, that's my yeah. offering. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting story. That's for sure. Um, yeah, so a lot, you know, <laughs> a lot, a lot of people love myths and fairy tales, but I think, um, yeah, so some of them are just, they're not so pleasant. And I think part of it is um, that's what kind of draws us to them is like, there there are some parallels to like real life, right? Um, in some fairy tales and in some myths and legends. Um, and it's like exaggerated, but we can see parallels. And um, this is just very interesting. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. And, um, there's uh, We were talking about the male gaze and the female gaze and all throughout this and, um, this is a particularly interesting story, I think, having to do with the male gaze and the female gaze. And um, yeah, really interesting. Thank you, Brenda. Awesome. All right, so next we have this lovely piece by Cecilia, Cecilia Cox. Um, are you here, Cecilia? All right, I don't think that she's here. I think she sent me an email saying she wouldn't put it. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes, I do. Um, yes, wonderful, good to see you. Okay, yes, tell us about your piece. Well, thank you, I'm, I'm so happy to be included in this wonderful exhibition. Um, 
Uh, I'm in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I'm looking forward to seeing the show at the Wilmington Museum. Um, I paint mostly still life in oil uh, from life. And I'm typically drawn to um, simpler compositions. And I like to contrast organic uh, natural objects with the man-made. And I love to explore textures. Um, my setups can sometimes take a few minutes to sometimes a couple of days. Uh, these cattails I saw on a morning walk uh, just immediately attracted my eye. Um, autumn is probably my favorite season of the year. Um, I find it kind of slightly melancholy and maybe touch of mystical qualities to it. Um, and I wanted to contrast the soft uh, textures of the cattails with the um, reflective quality of the glass. Um, the fluff was a lot of fun to paint. Uh, when I would go into my studio every morning, uh, the fluff would be bigger. <laughs> and it was fascinating to see, you know, uh, in close up, the, the transformation of the cattails uh, as they were going dormant and releasing the seeds that were going to be uh, new life in the next season. Um, so. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Yeah, this is such a beautiful piece. And um, I have a river by my house and I walk down and in the autumn there's cattails everywhere and I always like they're fun to like play with. <laughs> and I always bring them back to my house too. Yeah. So um, thank you so much, beautiful. Thank you. Yes. And um, I just wanna read a little bit of what you wrote too, cause I thought that was very beautiful. Um, um, you said, I saw these cattails on my morning walk last October and immediately felt inspired to paint them. October is a month of transition with a hint of melancholy for the end of summer and the anticipation of a time for drawing inward. In the transition from sol solidity to fluffy seed, I observed an example of the magic of nature of the mature plant reaching the end of its season of life, shedding what will be the source of new and spreading life, which I thought was really beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you, Cecilia. Thank you. Amazing. All right, so next we have this piece by um, Courtney Scheingraber. I think I, I hope I said your name right. Courtney, are you here? All right, I have a um, something that Courtney wrote that I will share. Um, Courtney says, oops, let me pull it up here. <clears throat> I was most inspired. So this is a um, pen and ink on paper artwork that is unframed, it's 11 by 14. And um, Courtney says, I was most inspired by the current psych psychedelic revolution. According to Oxford languages, illumination can refer not only to lighting or light, um, the art of illuminating a manuscript clarification, but also spiritual or intellectual enlightenment. With more research being done on molecules like psilocybin, some have found their lives being illuminated by the various visions and messages brought forth in their consciousness. And that is through using psychedelic mushrooms. So we see um, psychedelics here. <laughs> so uh, the mushrooms. Jump in for us a second. What'd you say? I might jump in for us a second on this one. Tell, tell us, yes. Um, so, like, I remember when this one came up, when we were uh, Jessica and I were kind of, uh, I was going through them, and she was sort of um, there to assist if necessary, and. Uh, uh, we weren't. Sh I I loved this piece, uh, um, um, and we had a little discussion about it because we weren't sure if it fit the pre-Raphaelite aesthetic. Um, and I, I mean, the, you know, the descript. I mean, you can almost pull any. You can probably take any kind of work and pull the pull a narrative out of it that would fit right um, into uh, whatever kind of show you're trying to get into, but. Uh, I suppose, but um, you know, I don't know. I thought that this kind of expanded the aesthetic of the entire show because you could have a more narrow show where everything really looks very a more narrow vision of 
pre-Raphaelite. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that this kind of expanded that and made it more contemporary because I think it's great to try and bring pre-Raphaelite philosophy, mm -hmm. aesthetic into a more contemporary um, um, room. And, and, uh, and so I thought this piece got into the show because I thought it, it was something different. I thought the quality was really good. I, it's kind of trippy and, you know, it's a little bit different in that way, but, um, um, you know, I just, I appreciated the, the broader, you know, sort of stretching of the aesthetic. Um, and, and so I, I was happy to see this piece get into the show. So. Absolutely. And, um, and also like the pre-Raphaelites, their main thing was nature. And this is definitely about nature. That's for sure. So thank you, Carrie. And thank you, Courtney. All right, so going around the gallery here, the virtual gallery. All right, so we have Colleen Smith and um, Colleen, um, I saw you here. So um, you can tell us about your work. I'm excited to hear. Hello. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to be included in this exhibition. Uh, the Pre-Raphaelites are near and dear to my heart. Uh, when I was in school, I always had a Waterhouse book nearby. So um, definitely have been really inspired by them like throughout my whole career. Um, you know, I really, I started this painting um, during one of the many uh, rainforest fires. And I was inspired by that and also wanted to, I was thinking about how we're like, we're everyone's obviously very concerned about everything's happening with climate change, but at the same time, we're also very complacent because we feel very helpless. And I work with myths a lot in my work. Um, so I was thinking a lot about Daphne and Apollo, which is a myth I've always been really fascinated by, not only because of course she turns into a tree, but um, also why uh, the fact that she's running away from being pursued by Apollo. Um, and so I wanted to take that and connect it to the climate crisis um, and how she's kind of almost like frozen in paralysis as everything's kind of like consuming around her. And so like the fires, um, you know, are representative of Apollo. Um, and Amazing. yeah, and I was just like, I love just taking and being able to put environments together. Um, and, you know, I've always been really inspired by the pre lights, especially with their gorgeous fabrics and their plant life. Um, and so I, you know, just have been inspired by that throughout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even though this is a heavy subject matter, um, I think it's really interesting how you pulled the mythology into it and also like how beautiful you made it. It's really, really beautiful and very yeah. thought provoking too. So, <laughs> Thank yeah. You. Yeah, this is like a, a contemporary interpretation of, of some of those same things. So mm -hmm. yeah, very cool. Yeah, thank you, appreciate yeah. it. All right, oops, wait, let me go back, yes. All right, so um, this is Cornelia, um, Cornelia Hernes, and um, I don't believe Cornelia is here tonight, um, but I just want to check. Um, Cornelia, are you here? All right, so Cornelia um, lives in another country, and I think it's like three in the morning there, so, um, but she does have something for me to read, which is lovely. Okay, so Cornelia Hernes, um, this is her Ophelia. And this is a unique oil on linen, 23 inches by 35 inches. And um, in the words of the artist, Ophelia is a Shakespearean character who is driven to madness by Hamlet's actions and ultimately dies by drowning. The archetypical tragedy of this Shakespearean drama has been depicted by many artists, including Waterhouse in Millet. In my depiction of Ophelia, she wanders in a shadowed forest and catches her balance on the branch of a tree. The deep woods present a protective space while simultaneously signifying potential danger. In addition to the theme of this painting, the colors in this composition, purple, gold, green, and earth reds, echo some of the color choices of Waterhouse's forest maidens. The works by the pre-Raphaelites were an early love for me in regards to the appreciation of visual and classical art. Their intertwined vision and aesthetic alignment offers the dimension of wonder, enchantment, and spellbinding storytelling. An aspect I find intriguing about William Waterhouse in particular is that his compositions and themes often appear serene and innocent in nature, 
While this is often juxtaposed with an ominous, ominous presence lurking in the shadows or just below the shimmering surface of water. In this realm of potions, dark forests and perilous waters, we can reflect on our human nature and process emotions of love, death, loss and danger while being elevated by magnificent beauty and visual poetry. Wow, that just gave me chills. That was, that was a great descriptor of this painting. Um, so this is Ophelia and uh, I think it's gorgeous. All the, all the layers of colors and her, her fabric and um, that light illuminating her hair. It's just gorgeous. This so. definitely makes me wish I could see this show in real life. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I know, uh, maybe next year. <laughs> I know Cornelia a little bit. Um, she was teaching um, her husband, Stephen Bauman, teach, uh, taught at Florence Academy in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, and they both trained in Florence. Um, um, so I've crossed paths with them a little bit. They're both, yeah, very superb academic painters. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So thank you, Cornelia. All right, so next we have um, Christy Dunn. And Christy, I saw that you are here. So um, you are welcome. To us. Hi Good there. Back. Can you Hi. hear me? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I'm very grateful to be included in, in this show with these amazing artists. It's been so much fun. Um, this painting has some autobiographical elements. It's, uh, it was inspired by memories of lots of hours spent in the woods painting as a young artist. Um, it's very much about place. My life and work are deeply rooted in the music and the culture and the beauty of the landscape in the East Tennessee mountains. Amazing, wonderful. And this is, is this, this is silver leaf, right? It is, I, I use a lot of uh, silver leaf in my work. I really enjoy the ethereal um, effect that it gives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I love how it, it really changes like where, wherever you um, walk around the painting, it like illuminates it in different aspects. So um, yeah, very, definitely a lot of pre raphaelite elements here with an, an illumination too. the nature, the female figure, the, um, the illuminated uh, aspect to it. So amazing. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you. All right. All right, so next we have um, two pieces by Danielle Rakowski. I'm gonna show you the pieces first, and then I am going to um, play her. She has a, um, a video for us to play actually um, of her because she couldn't be here today. So, um, so yeah, this is one. Um, this is Golden by Danielle Rakowski. Um, so um, Golden and Cyclical Renewal were, were inspired by floral imagery found in classical still life paintings. By sourcing imagery from still life paintings and using her own textured images of floral and plant life, she creates digital fine arts images with imaginative and painterly aesthetics. Um, by inserting herself into both images, she becomes a part of the still life and a bot botanical being. Um, yes, so this is Golden. And then this next one is um, cyclical renewal. And um, a lot of the pre-Raphaelites did a lot of self-portraits. Um, so this is very um, pre-Raphaelite in that way, as well as just the aesthetic of it. Um, all of the, you know, painterly looking um, details in the, uh, the floral surrounding the figure, again, the female figure, uh, especially this one, we chose this for one of the show images because, um, you know, people think of pre-Raphaelite and they think of like that, that red Titian hair and, um, you know, this just really seemed to encapsulate a lot of what we were trying to do with the show. Um, and then also like illumination, you know, the very golden light, um, you know, we thought was just really, really amazing. Okay, so um, let me share this video, which I thought was lovely the way that she, um, she talks about her work. I'll just take a second for it to load. Okay. And I am going to 
stop the share for a second so that I can um, share her screen. Okay. Here we go. Hi, my name is Daniela Kowski, and I am a digital artist, a photo artist, and a self-portrait artist from New Jersey. Golden and Cyclical Renewal are self-portraits that were inspired by the floral imagery found from classical still life paintings. By sourcing floral imagery from still lives and using my own textual images of nature, I transform myself into my own still life or botanical being. In Golden, there's a golden aura of light that weaves in and out. And in Encyclical Renewal, emotional energies converge, harmonize, and intertwine. Overall, there is an intuitive connection between nature and self. The themes that I explore are related to stages of the healing process, where I learn spiritual harmony, growth, expansion, healing, resilience, enlightenment, and how to transform pain into empowerment. Complex and magical shades of personal and creative illumination create a contemplative and introspective gaze which reflect and reveal the inner reality of the subject. Thank you for listening and for viewing my works. Yay, thank you so much, Danielle. That was amazing. Love her work. I wouldn't mind saying a word or two. Yes, say, say away. <laughs> um, so I, when these came up, I mean, you know, and we talked about this on the podcast um, last week a little bit, um, which is that this is the first show that I've, uh, well, curated kind of on my own, I guess. I mean, I've, I've done things in the past where, you know, you give an, you're one of a jury of three to give out an art prize and give out prizes. And that's an interesting experience because um, you always wonder in competitions, how, how did that piece get in or why didn't my piece get in? And, and when you go through a, a process like that, it, it's interesting because you really see the other side. So curating the show along with with Jessica has been a somewhat similar experience. Um, and, and we talked about this in the podcast, which is that, you, um, you know, you look at the art through a different lens. Like usually you're going through life and you're like, I like this, I don't like this, you know, this is okay, I love this. You kind of have your personal viewpoint, but when you're creating a show for a, a gallery, you look through the world, you look at art through a different lens. And I don't know if I would have, you know, this is photography, you know, I'm a painter, you know, so, I think a pre-Raphaelite is paintings, um, uh, you know, but of course, you know, uh, we can easily, I think in today's day, you know, branch out of just that one particular medium. I don't know if I would have really looked at these photographs. I would have looked at them and been like, oh yeah, you know, like, that's cool. You know, it's a digital photograph that's been manipulated in, in my regular life, but looking at it through the cure, as a curator for, for uh, a gallery, um, and these came across, I don't know, I saw them with a new lens and I was really kind of blown away by these, by these pieces um, by Danielle. Uh, um, and I just thought that they were very unique and um, very beautiful to look at. Um, and I was surprised at how much I liked them. Uh, so, you know, and I, I think the aesthetic, you know, certainly seems, you know, seems to fit in with the, with the pre-Raphaelite kind of, um, uh, philosophy. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I just want to share that. Thanks, Carrie. And uh, thank you so much, um, Danielle. Beautiful work. All right. So next, um, we have Fred Wessel. Fred is not able to be here with us tonight, but Fred is an, he's an amazing painter. He paints in um, egg tempera, which is very difficult. I have tried it and it is very difficult. If anyone's ever tried it, but he is a master at what he does. And um, so, yes, this is called Megan by Fred Wessel. It's an original egg tempera and gold leaf on panel piece. It's 21 inches by 25 inches, and um, it includes the frame. And in the words of Fred, his inspiration for the piece, um, Megan was created during a three month residency in Cortona, Italy. Um, yes, uh, he was, um, he was thrilled to be surrounded and inspired by the works of his Italian Renaissance heroes, who were also the heroes of the pre-Raphaelite painters. Megan's costume was borrowed from a local Cortonese who dons it yearly for the 
Archie Dado, a wonderful medieval festival performed in, the, in beautiful authentic garb. The painting was made during harvest and celebrates the beauty of the model Megan, the richness of her own gown and the abundance of the Cortona harvest. It is painted in egg tempera using the techniques documented by Sen, 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 Senino, Senini, a 14th century painter and writer in his book, um, Il Libro dell'Arte. The background is 23 karat gold leaf. So um, Fred is really immersed in um, the craft of his work. It's really technically amazing. And um, so we're so excited to have Fred's work here with us. Um, so yeah, this is Megan. Thank you, Fred. All right, so next, um, we have a very interesting piece by Alana Ellis called The Mirror. And um, Alana, are you here today? I am here. Yay! I'm here. <laughs> yes, it, yes, tell us about your work. Great, thank you. Also, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be a part of this. Um, yeah, so this painting, um, I was looking at a Titian painting on vanity, and, and there's a whole theme of paintings um, where you have women holding mirrors and they usually signify vanity. And I was really intrigued. I was like, well, they usually only reflect rooms. And I was really intrigued by the possibility of having the mirror reflect an entire scene and having a sort of like, you know, I guess painting in a painting effect. Um, so that was the genesis of this painting. And as far as the relation to the show, I've been very interested in trying to illuminate images that come from the unconscious and paint them and sort of the seeds, I guess it would be the seeds of new myths and seeing how that they arise in the unconscious, how they arise in a modern person, how they reflect a modern person and use those older beautiful imagery that I'm so inspired by, that the pre-Raphaelites were so inspired by, that the old masters that the pre-Raphaelites were um, inspired by, were inspired by and a whole chain of inspiration down history. So. Um, that's the genesis of the painting. Yeah, amazing, beautiful. Um, <laughs> you're probably gonna hate me for this, but it reminds me of, um, uh, if you've ever seen It's a Wonderful Life where um, he tells her, I'm gonna lasso the moon. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's just, um, I think it's, cause that's, is that a moon up there? That they're kind is of- moon? Oh my God, I never made that connection. Oh my God. <laughs> I actually love that. That's a completely different interpretation that I didn't have, but I love that movie. Yeah. So I actually, that's fascinating. That's the thing that I really love. I love trying to find images, but then seeing how they speak to different people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's immediately what I thought of. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lasso you the moon, so. Um, I yeah. love that. I love that interpretation. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, okay, amazing. So this is 16 by 20 um, oil on panel. Thank you so much, Ilana, beautiful work. And I love the idea of the subconscious and kind of like illuminating that because I think it's really fascinating. So awesome. Okay, next are my pieces actually. So um, yeah, these are, these are my pieces here. This is the first one. This is the one that I was speaking of, um, uh, you know, at the beginning when um, we were talking about the male gaze, the female gaze. And um, in this one, um, you know, some, there's a figure kind of languidly lounging, holding a, a fruit and um, um, looking very inviting. And, um, you know, typically you see like women painted like this. And, um, and I wanted to kind of like paint a man like this. And um, so, so this is a painting that I did. Um, and in this piece, this is called April. And um, it is oil paint with genuine silver leaf on a 10 by 12 um, cradle panel. And um, in this piece, the cherry blossoms form a magical protective canopy over the figures, casting a romantic backdrop for the narrative unfolding. I was inspired by the pre-Raphaelite and Rococo subject matter of couples beneath a tree enjoying the outdoors, some unspoken dynamic existing between the two, but it is up for the viewer to decide. The, the silver leaf in the sky flattens the space stylistically and creates an otherworldly classical effect that relates to the idea of illumination. So that is this piece. 
And then I have another one here. This one is called The Reading. Okay, so um, The Reading is um, a unique painting, original, made with oil paint, 23 karat gold leaf. It's 16 by 20 inch. And in this piece, I wanted to create a yin and yang composition with the figures, alluding to the polarity of the feminine and the masculine. I was inspired by the pre-Raphaelite and Rococo subject matter. Again, couples beneath the tree, enjoying the outdoors. And um, yeah, the gold leaf is also included in this one. And um, it is um, beneath the apples actually, and then also like interspersed in the, um, the cloth underneath the um, figures. And then, yeah, and then in a lot of the um, pre-Raphaelite works, it's really set outdoors, very lush um, landscapes, very dappled light, kind of like um, filtered light. And I wanted to try to do something like that here and capture that beautiful light of, um, you know, the sun coming through the trees from an unusual standpoint. I like the almost abstract quality of, of that composition. Oh, thank you, Carrie. Um, okay, so Jonathan, I saw you here. Next we have Jonathan and um, tell us about your work, Jonathan. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, first I'd like to thank you all. I'm so inspired by all of you. Um, yeah, here's a bit about my piece. So Sunday's Best was created in my junior year of undergraduate. Um, and I explored themes of purity culture and growing up as a child in church and the expectations placed on the young. Um, using references such as Ophelia in the background, like the back painting, um, and the white roses and the little phone in her hand. I wanted to convey um, an environment that felt familiar familial, but also unnerving. Um, so my work explores the links between American idealism and religious iconography from both my personal stories juxtaposed um, with art historical references and themes. And so Sunday's Best was a chance for me to explore my love of Sargent and the grace of Rossetti and the sadness of Hopper. So yeah, I hope you enjoy. Wow, I can really see influences of all that in your piece now that you mention it. So that's really cool hearing, hearing you know, each artist as they tell us about their work because, you know, you can you can you can infer things when you look at a piece, but it's always fascinating hearing from the artist um, their intentions and you know who who they're kind of looking at as they're creating their pieces because we all are influenced by something. So um, very cool. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, yeah. The, I think the composition in this painting is is what really helps it to stand out. I think that's what Jessica and I both kind of responded to. There's, yeah, there's just something about the way she's centered. She's looking directly at you. The design of the dress, you know, I hadn't even noticed that that was that a painting that the painting of Ophelia in the background until you mentioned it just now. Um, yeah, the composition is really strong, and then like, you know. Uh, um, you know, it does have a very wholesome quality and, and, and um, I didn't even know she had a phone. I didn't realize that <laughs> until now. And the fact that her knee is sticking out gives it a slight sensual hint of something, which I didn't think about until I was just looking at it now, which I don't know if that was the intention or not, but you know, I, you know, I could, um, um, that's kind of what, it, what I think about slightly. And then, yeah, I don't know, very, very strong composition. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Awesome. Yeah, beautiful. All right, so next we have um, Julianne Jonker. And um, Julianne um, was in last year's as well. So um, Julianne, I see you here. So tell us about this piece. All right, you can hear me okay? Yes. All right, well, thank you to both of you for including me in the exhibition again. I was so happy because when I saw you at the Sotheby's exhibition, you didn't know if you were gonna do this. So I hope that I pushed you a little bit to do another pre-Raphaelite. <laughs> awesome that you're doing this. Um, my painting here is on gold leaf. There's a little bit of encaustic wax and cold wax and oils on the gold leaf. And the subject matter, Lady Godiva and the Black Knight. My model is another artist and we wanted to do this for years. We talked about having her be Lady Godiva. That's her real hair. 
-hmm. And we finally found this Frisian gorgeous horse. We were both in love with the horse. And I almost named it What Blonde because he thinks he is so cool that it's almost like he was really the subject, not her, but it's not supposed to be funny. So I didn't name it that, but that's kind of what you see in his face. Like he just knows he is the stud. <laughs> Story of Lady Godiva, like the Pre-Raphaelites, it has a subtle political story. We all know that she drove through the city naked, but the reason she did it was her husband was gonna impose these exorbitant taxes on the people. And he said, until you ride through the city naked on a horse, you're not gonna change my mind. And that's why she did it in the legend. And the Pre-Raphaelites sometimes had political messages in there. So between her, her beauty, the horse, the gold leaf, and the story, I felt like it fit the Pre-Raphaelite. Oh, definitely, absolutely. Yeah, love Lady Godiva, all the images of Lady Godiva. Love it. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful painting. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julian. Gorgeous. All right. So next we have um, Kathleen. Kathleen Carr. Are you here? Are you here, Kathleen? I thought I might have seen her, but um, I do have something that Kathleen wrote about her work. So this is called Birds of Solitude. It's an original oil on panel, eighteen by twenty-four. And um, in her words, um, the pre raphaelites aim was to create works um, that were uniquely from the artist's perspective, painting those around them, things they loved, and revealing something only they could reveal in a painting. Their movement was a reaction against what they thought was the stilted academic style uh, where the subject seemed remote and lacking in realness. My daughter is depicted in Birds of Solitude and was going through a difficult time. And I think that internal struggle can be seen in her expression. So this is Birds of Solitude by Kathleen Carr. I just wanna say, I love her use of values like in just the subtle gradations, it's just gorgeous. And we have a second one by Kathleen actually. This is a self portrait by um, Kathleen Carr. And um, um, in the words of the artist, her inspiration was, in my self-portrait, I was seeking to reveal something of my own inner strength and attitude, yet hearkening back to portraits from art history. In all my paintings, I'm fascinated by light, pattern, and beauty. And yes, it definitely harkens back to art history um, with the central focus of the figure, and then also her costume or her, her clothing choices, I feel is very um, kind of Renaissance, um, hearkening back to another time. So that is Kathleen Carr. Thank you, Kathleen. Next we have Carrie. So Carrie, um, this is my favorite painting of Carrie's, I think. Um, so Carrie, tell us about this piece. Sure. Um, I forgot that I was going to have to speak about these paintings. Um, <laughs> you know, I often don't know what my paintings are going to eventually be about when I start them. Sometimes I do, sometimes I have an idea, but often I don't uh, I don't have a specific idea. I just might have an image or I might have some sort of technical thing I wanna try and just see what happens. Um, I'm a very crafts oriented, I think, um, painter. So I did a series of paintings where I just wanted to do, you know, during the pandemic and, you know, started working from photographs a lot more heavily than I had ever in the past. and. Um, and I wanted to just explore the palette knife as a painting tool because the palette knife is a very crude instrument. Um, and there's something about a crude instrument, you know, Francis Bacon talked about it, he could, it'd be easy, it was better, if he could get a likeness by painting with a mop hmm. better than if, better than like a fine paint paintbrush because um, the paintbrush, um, Trying to, now I can't remember exactly uh, how he put it, but um, you know, there's something in not in, in in the abstractedness or the the unconscious, you know, putting something down it taps into something else rather than when you're always in full control, you tend to almost lose something. I don't know. I could definitely word that a lot better, um, but you know, I, I I like the abstract. I love. I'm a big fan of abstract expressionism, and um, so the palette knife 
for me is a way to not be so finessing and so in control and to and and to be excited every time you put paint down because you don't always know what's going to happen um so it's the it's the continually the happy accident from start to finish and and then trying to control it and when you're painting with a when i'm painting with a palette knife i tend to get much more jewel like colors everything's more raw um and you know i think this was the first one in that series it's actually a copy of an old master painting <clears throat> um and you know the flesh tones the colors are kind of scintillating um uh, uh and uh you know it almost has you know if anything in relationship um if it does have anything in relationship with the pre-raphaelites it's definitely the color the jewel light color um you know, maybe a little bit of the style of the dress, uh, of the clothing, um, and you know, definitely some of that classical, being that it's a copy of an old master painting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then as I work it, usually for me, the 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 idea tends to reveal itself to me somewhere in the middle of the process. So, um, I just like the coyness of this particular um, character. Um, you know, there's definitely something a little bit sly. <laughs> um and, and so it, it's kind of it's really a character study as, as well i would say so yeah awesome yeah. yeah i love it i love the kind of i love the colors i love um the values i love um that brilliant little eye that you see like just a slit of that color yeah it's really great and the delicacy of the hand um it's amazing that you did all this with a palette knife but yeah great job and then we have a second one by Carrie. We rise. Yeah, so this this is this painting. I did a series of paintings that I actually did them all with a lot of them with palette knife. Not all of them, but many of them. When I was working from these old black and white photographs, a lot of them are mug shots from like the 1920s um, when when photography was first being used. And um, so this is from I have a whole kind of series of, of different Paint. I love the characters of those old mug shots. Um, you know, when you're looking at these old black and white photographs, you can't help but imagine what these people's lives must have been like. And they're in black and white, so you can really experiment with the color, which is um, a, a technical exercise that's kind of that I enjoy. Um, and, and this painting here, this particular youth, uh, just had a very fresh face. Um, you know, and he's looking upward. It's it's also, I mean, even though it's an old mugshot, and he's um, from like the 1920s or so. Um, it has a very op. This particular one has a very optimistic uh, uh, quality quality about it, and so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we um, yeah we were thinking that like the illumination with like the yellow color and like that feeling of optimism, it kind of relates to the show in that in that way, so. Great, thank you, Carrie. You're welcome. All right, so our next piece is by Leah Mitchell. Uh, Leah, is are you here? Yes, I'm here. Awesome. Hello. Thank you so much for being part of the show. Thank you for having me. This is this was a very exciting uh, show idea for me. I've been working with uh, medieval imagery uh, and been inspired by the Pre-Raphaelites for quite some time. So it was sort of this serendipitous coming together of these two loves of mine. Um, right now, my body of work is pulling heavily on uh, imagery from illuminated manuscripts and also my own personal sort of symbolism sets that talk about kind of how, how we define beauty and how we define purity and how we define beauty, especially as it relates to young women. And so in this one, I put um, a unicorn and a maiden, which are two very prominent themes. Um, there's whole tapestry sets of the ladies and the unicorn. And when I first started kind of looking into this medieval imagery of the unicorn, I was surprised at how wild the unicorns looked. They have cloven hooves and bared teeth and wild manes. And the unicorns that we associate with young girls today, which I have two daughters, so there's a lot of unicorns in the house, are, are very tame in comparison. 
And I was actually really referencing um, the lady in the unicorn where she holds a mirror up to the unicorn and the, the mythology surrounding the unicorn now says that only a virgin can capture a unicorn, but in medieval, the medieval period, um, it was that only the pure in heart could approach the unicorn uh, and be in the presence of the unicorn. And so for the maiden to hold up the, uh, the, the mirror to the unicorn was to reflect his wild purity back at him. And I was just thinking about how we've tamed that down and we've tamed what we expect of young girls and how we portray them and kind of box them in. And which is why I put that white outline and uh, around her to kind of contain her and keep her very malleable and easy to digest. Oh my gosh. I love that all. And I just feel illuminated by what you just said. <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I know you sent in a little statement, but that's, that's so much deeper than it, it just went so much deeper than what I realized. So, um, yeah, beautiful, amazing work. I'm such a sucker for unicorns. So we had to put this one in. Um, have you ever been to the, um, the cloisters in New York? I have not. I'm hoping to eventually. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I had the chance to see all those big unicorn tapestries and it, it is really amazing. So um, it, this, this piece reminded me of, of that. And um, yeah, I enjoyed seeing your bird on your shoulder as well. <laughs> so thank you so much, you. Yeah. All right, so next we have Lisa, Lisa Hendrickson. Um, are you here, Lisa? I am here, Jessica, thank you. Awesome, well, tell us about your work, Lisa. Um, well. As, as others have said, thank you so much, uh, Jessica and Carrie, for including me in the show. Um, great honor and, and very exciting to see that um, there are some, some shows that are promoting um, realism and, and um, uh, beautifully executed works. Um, so, so my work is not, um, I'll say traditionally along the lines of the pre-Raphaelite um, subject matters, but what inspired me is, you know, the words um, that are associated with it, um, luminous, shining, um, to enlighten spiritually or intellectually. And so um, my piece, uh, in, in generally in my work, I try to um, visually tell the stories of people and places that I've experienced. And the resulting images offer a window into the underlying emotions and the inner character of my subjects. At least that's what I hope. Um, my work, I call this Into the Light, symbolizes how trapped many of us felt during the pandemic. Trapped in our homes, trapped maybe in jobs that we weren't enjoying, um, and trapped by fear. So the composition um, shows a woman who's seemingly trapped in a dark space and she's looking out. In contrast, the illumination from the window washes over her, symbolizing physical and spiritual hope, which is you know, along the lines of the pre-Raphaelites. Um, and especially during these turbulent times, it's important to work towards personal enlightenment and following one's dreams. So um, the, this kind of isolated young woman um, could be an, an older woman, could be anyone, but um, really looking towards finding what's important and um, escaping from the trapped environment that we've all felt for like the last two years. Yeah, beautiful. That's, yeah, it, it really relates to the theme. And um, I think that we can all resonate with it to some extent. So, um, and beautiful execution too. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So um, yeah, next we have Lorenzo Narciso. Um, Lorenzo, are you here? Um, yes, I'm here. Hey, I'm here. Lorenzo, how are you? Hi, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Thanks. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, tell us about this piece. Um, so this piece is called Moon. Um, it's a drawing around 13 by 17 inches. 
And um, yeah, um, I think I spoke a lot about what it meant, but the gist of it is really that um, it really talks more about the symbol of the moon and how it's more about how exploring the subconscious and kind of like the wisdom that we have that is kind of like buried beneath our egos. And um, I think it's a pretty, um, I, I, I would say sensitive portrait of a woman. And um, I think aside from like pre-Raphaelite inspiration, um, I was also like pretty inspired by tonalist landscapes. Mm. So if you really zoom in and actually, I wish you guys could see it in person. Um, I paid a lot of attention to the simple background of it in the distance. And um, yeah, um, it was really an exploration of line and how thing, I could like curve things up in sort of a way that kind of describes distance and something that would rather like pull you in and a sort of like adventurous, mysterious sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite part of this is actually, um, aside from the rendering of her portrait, is actually the reflection of the moon. Mm -hmm. um, I just found it like a really fun, interesting design element for this piece. Amazing, yeah. yes. I love this piece. Um, yeah, I can definitely see the tonalist influences and I love like the compressed values in this piece. It just makes it very like calming to look at. And yeah, her eyes, I would say that this, I would describe this piece as evocative. It's like, you wanna know more and it definitely pulls you in. And there's definitely like kind of a somber, peaceful feeling to it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, if I was gonna put like a song to it, it would be Claire de Lune. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty, pretty good, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice to listen to it while you look at the drawing, I suppose. Right. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah, I think this does a good job of, um, uh, uh, and I think in your other piece as well, you can really get a sense of the emotional interior world of the of the character. Um, like I, I you know, like this piece definitely, my your imagination goes off, which is, uh, um, you know, what a lot of those pre raphaelites were also good at doing. Um, yeah, I want to know more about this story and this person and, and, and um, really nice job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate it. And uh, Lorenzo, you have another piece and that is um, called Distance. So tell us about this piece. Um, uh, I guess it's pretty much um, more about like longing and pining. Um, it's a portrait of a man and there's like, he's staring out into the distant ocean. And if, you, if you're able to like look closely, I really paid a lot of attention to the detail. Um, if you could walk up to the painting, let's say you're there in person, you'd be able to see like a very distant city. Um, it's actually pretty similar to my moon drawing. If you look into the distance of a landscape there, there's also a distant city. And I guess, um, Actually, what Carrie was saying about how my work is really um, moody, I would suppose, I suppose. I really feel like as an artist, I really pay attention to kind of like my internal world and how I experience emotions, yes. And so the main emotional aspect for this piece that inspired it was really just feeling pining and longing. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe it's like part of being stuck in my studio apartment during the pandemic. I couldn't really go anywhere. I couldn't really see people. And yeah, um, this was really an exploration of like um, that sort of emotional element, pining and longing that we all feel. Um, technically, I think this was also a way for me to like explore painting using my imagination and kind of like set the tone for something, a really glowing atmosphere. And I was really happy with how it turned out and how I kind of made the ocean as a sort of like reflective mirror with the 
glowing light across the horizon. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and we have a couple of comments too. Um, Lorenzo, I love it. Intriguing, love this. Excellent work feeling all the emotions. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. All right, so now we have um, Louis Alvarez Bore. Did I say that right? The mute button, it should be on the bottom left-hand corner or it might be on the top left-hand corner. Okay, I think I got it now. Yes, I'm sorry about we hear that. you. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you, Carrie, for um, such a beautiful job here in this uh, show. My pain, my, actually, uh, the first time I uh, have an encounter with the team, with the theme of the team was uh, through a piano piece. Um, it's, it's a be beautiful uh, composition by the French composer Maurice Ravel. And um, that's that's exactly uh, listening to the piece. That's what really started uh, because I know I knew what Undine was about more or less, but listening to the piano piece it really really uh, motivated me to create like um, visual uh, personal presentation of what uh, Undine could could be mm -hmm. uh, for me. And looking, um, then I started uh, reading uh, about different, because this is a very uh, old uh, uh, mythological character. But then I learned that uh, it's always different. It's, it's never the same exact story through history. And um, so different writers have uh, put uh, different connotations to the subject. So sometimes Undine is, uh, it's really not a good character and sometimes it's a good one. And um, um, painting, uh, working on my painting, um, I really wanted to um, really focus on her gaze and her presence and, and really to create a character that in, in a sense can reflect power especially as a woman and something that it's been I think uh, uh, not not uh, precisely uh, uh, women has, has haven't been always shown in, in a power uh, position and so uh, my my intention in painting uh, apart from uh, being taken from the, the mythology, which is a quite powerful uh, um, character, but uh, but yes, so I wanted to be um, um, to create something that is that reflects uh, some sort of power. I I actually didn't I wasn't inspired about any of the pre-Raphaelite like work. It just happened to end up. Uh, Looking so similar to a pre-Raphaelite uh, <laughs> artwork. Actually, as a matter of fact, uh, first time I posted this this picture in my social media, uh, a friend of mine who, who, who really knows a lot about painting, the first thing he wrote was pre-Raphaelite, <laughs> and so I guess there's something that somehow was channeling. The, yeah. Oh, definitely. The I mean, I, I definitely think of like Rossetti's. Um, huge because this is a big painting too um huge paintings of like these like really powerful women with like red hair like just overpowering everything and yeah it's um it's a very striking piece and i love her um her expression and the composition of her her garb um is really interesting and um yeah very very interesting shapes and um yeah lo love this piece um, yeah, gorgeous. Thank you so much. Yeah, what a gorgeous uh, composition. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Gary. All right, so next we have um, Morgan Dummett. And um, Morgan uh, was not able to be here today, but I do have um, something very beautiful that he wrote about this 
absolutely mind-blowing sculpture, which I was just amazed by that somebody today was able to make this by hand. So, um, so this is called Carriated, and this is an original hand sculpted gilt, bronze, and marble sculpture, 47 inches tall, 23 inches wide, and 14 inches in, in dimension. Um, and Morgan just completed this in 2021. So this is, he hand sculpted this, and then he gilded it um, with bronze. Um, I'm sorry, he, he used the, he gilt the bronze in like the details and then the, the face is like marble. So this is what um, Morgan says about the work. Most straightforwardly, Cariated is an expression, exploration of the visual impact of gilding or illuminating a polychrome marble sculpture. I had originally intended to patina the bronze crown and drapery black to create a stark contrast with the, the white marble. While working on the casting and carving, I started to wonder how the opposite combination of two bright reflective materials, both gold and marble, would play off one each other. Where would the eye come to rest in the relative lack of strong shadows? And would the marble hold its visual weight against the huge fields of gold? I took the leap and I'm pleased with the result aesthetically and because of how the materia materiality influences the content. The sculpture is somewhat melancholy, the downcast eye of the woman in the sculpture bending beneath the weight of the enormous crown. The crown in the sculpture was inspired by a crumbling circular bell tower in a church that I used to pass on the way to my studio before it was being torn down. The piece is my reflection on the practic practically unmarked disappearance of something so beautifully and meticulously constructed and the struggle of holding on to classical modes of art in a time which does not value them over much. I feel that the use of the baroquely gaudy gold leaf draws attention to these themes. At one point, the cariated vestments and crown were bright and valuable um, with the impossibility of holding them, holding them up forever seems inherent in the design. The sculpture is mounted on a mahogany sockle and a pedestal is available. So that is the amazing sculpture um, by Morgan Dummett. And um, if you wanna see more pictures of this, like in the round, um, they are available on the website, www.ericcontemporary.com, where you can see detailed shots of all of these actually, and you can purchase them. So um, as a reminder, these are all for sale. Um, they're all on ericcontemporary.com. You can purchase right off the website. So, that is Morgan. Thank you so much, Morgan. And yes, Carrie. Such a, a, a this is one of the pieces we we're we we're, uh, you know, it just has such a I could has such a contemporary um, feel to it. You know that it's it's nice to see uh, such a broad range with within the show. And um, um, yeah, this is this is really cool, really really fascinating piece. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, very impressive. Very. Looks like a lot of work went into that. Okay, this is by Nancy B. Miller, and um, and um, Nancy, tell us about this piece. Uh, thank you for uh, including my piece in this wonderful show. Um, this is a small, rough paper drawing using charcoal and uh, white chalk, and it was done from a Zoom life session. Um, the interesting thing about the pandemic for me was all the live, live models who went on to Zoom. So this was from an Edinburgh model and I, I did it over a Zoom session sponsored by uh, the Scottish Borders Drawing Club. <laughs> so that was really fun. Um, and so you're drawing the model in real time, which is really amazing. So I was so, even though it was very quick, it was only maybe a five minute pose. Um, I just thought it, there was something about this model. I love this model. I've drawn her many times since. Her name is uh, Zahn and uh, it's, she's from Edinburgh, uh, Scotland and she's a terrific model. There's something about her that I find very evocative. Um, what I think connects me to the pre-Raphaelite movement with this little quick sketch, which is not what you think of with pre-Raphaelites, is that they often did little quick sketches. <laughs> uh, they don't always get put in big gilt frames and, and shown, but they, they definitely was part of their, their of. 
Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of some sketches of Fanny Eaton, who was one of their favorite models. I don't know if you guys know the history of Fanny Eaton, who was part Jamaican. Uh, and she was one of the models uh, favored by the Pre-Raphaelites. Um, I'm particularly thinking of a drawing by Simeon uh, um, Solomon, who is one of the Pre-Raphaelites, but not one of the most famous ones, but he was still in the Brotherhood. And then some of the drawings by some of the women, um, like Joanna Wells and also Elizabeth Siddle, who did lots of little sketches and and rough charcoal drawings. So um, I think it does fit in in a sort of side door way. <laughs> I know when you when you say pre-Raphaelite, you think of bright technicolor detail in glaring sunlight or with you know evocative moonlight, but they did a lot of uh, these little sketches as well. So yeah. I'm just happy to be included. And I'm a huge pre-Raphaelite fan, so I, I, I've been uh, reading about them and visiting uh, the work for, for decades. <laughs> so awesome. this was a thrill for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. And we have a comment about it, um, uh, that the Delaware Art Museum has a Simeon Solomon with Fanny Eaton as the model. So yes. you want to yes. go see that? Yes, they do. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Have you seen it? Yes. Oh, okay. Perfect. <laughs> I've awesome. visited it many times. It's oh, like okay. a, a pilgrimage place for me to go there. I, I awesome. Loved it. Yeah. So thank you thank for you. including me. <laughs> of course. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you. All right. So our next one, and we, I think we only have four left, but um, this one is by Sharon Pamels Towsey. Sharon, are you here? Okay, well, um, Sharon um, did give me something to read here. Um, and let me just go to that here. Here we go, okay. So this piece is, um, is an original oil gold leaf and eco glitter painting on panel that's framed and is 41 and a half inches by 46 inches. So it's pretty large. And um, this is what Sharon says about her inspiration for the piece. This piece was inspired by watching my daughter in a moment of introspection, removed from the distractions of the internet, contemplating the wonders of the ocean during a visit to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. The light coming from the aquarium illuminates her face, the gold leaf and eco glitter adding a wonderful light to the painting. And um, yeah, I thought this was um, just a very unique painting. The, the brilliance of the colors is certainly very pre-Raphaelite as is the, um, the nature. Um, I think it's a really unique and fresh you know, take on that because of the underwater colors. And also the pre-Raphaelites were so invested in like being present in nature. And I think this really captures like a moment where you know, nature is so captivating that we put away other distractions. So um, this is a beautiful piece by Sharon. And it's like a, a contemporary interpretation of, of those ideas. Exactly. Yes. She's putting her phone away like we all need to. <laughs> okay. So um, thank you, Sharon. So next we have one by Victoria. Victoria Corasaus. Or Saros, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello, Victoria. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. It, it's a Greek last name, so don't worry about it. It's very, it's oh, very okay. difficult. <laughs> no problem. Um, well, first, I want to say thank you to you and to Carrie for including me. Um, at first, when I when I saw the the theme of the show, I wasn't sure my work would fit in. Um, but then I thought, you know, the pre-Raphaelites, what their passion was to sort of um, you know, highlight the the art and the legends and the myths of a previous time. For them, they were really sort of spotlighting the the tales of the Middle Ages and sort of the simplicity of the design and the decorative elements from the Middle Age, the you know pre-Raphael um, time. So. For me, I'm a couple centuries off, but um, <laughs> I feel a kinship with them because I, um, 
my work is what I want to do is is to highlight uh, work of the the past as well, but for mine is for the Rococo era. And um, this particular painting um, starts with a Boucher as a reference. It's from a much bigger painting. Um, it's Vulcan presenting Venus with uh, arms for Aeneas. And I always use um, historical elements as my starting point. And then I try to sort of take them out of context and use part of it to sort of evoke um, the 18th century feel, but still sort of modernize it in a way. So for this particular one, I just used Venus and one of her maidens and then use the colors to sort of, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, sort of evoke that era. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. <laughs> and I love your, I love your, um, the look of your work is very interesting too. Do you, you use a lot of different layers to like kind of go over top of the colors? I do. I do. In fact, and I usually paint over lots of other paintings that I don't like. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have lots. And, and what I, what I tend to do is start, um, more literal, um, you know, like more, I start as a copy and then it evolves on its own. Mm. So you can see some of the blue um, that's pulling out in the background. That's from previous paintings and then also looking at the original uh, reference. Um, but by toning it down with the pink around it, the blue sort of pops out on its own and becomes a different design element. Um, so yeah, I, I like to use the paint to sort of tell its own story and have it evolve. Amazing. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, great. Awesome. Yeah, I love, I love how you're taking something older and making it contemporary. And yeah, I think that a lot of the, the themes are very similar, like the, um, you know, the, the figures, the figurative aspects and um, the way that you're using decorative elements and, you know, the myths and legends. I think it's, yeah. it's really great. So beautiful work. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so this is Zara, Zara Kand. Um, Zara, are you here? I am here, just had to unmute myself. It's so good to be here. Thank you so much for having me, um, both to Carrie and Jessica and yeah, I'm just glad, proud to be here with all these other wonderful artists. Um, so I'm not going to get too analytical about this piece. I'll, I'll leave that up to the, the viewer to decide um, how, they, how they feel about it. But uh, basically, it's, it's a tale of a lady that has had a premonition of her own death. And so she is going on this journey um, to meet death. Uh, she's holding a bouquet of dead flowers and she has to walk through a field of alive, you know, fresh flowers. And down at the end of the path is um, where she would be meeting death. And you can see in the corner there, sort of like a grim reaper figure. So death personified. Um, and so she she is a young lady, but but she has accepted her fate because you know we we don't always have control over the course of events in one's throughout one's lifetime. So um, yeah, I I wanted to make it seem like more of a a transition um, full of light rather than something dark. Mm -hmm. And uh, aesthetically, it's funny, I just wanted to share because we've been talking about technique and, and brushwork and all that, that um, I intentionally kind of muted my, uh, the, the texture of my, of my brushwork in this piece because um, I, I, I had the notion that, you know, the pre-Raphaelites didn't use real thick, you know, broad brush strokes, everything was real defined and kind of smooth. Now I'm really realizing that I, I could have done it in whichever way I wanted to. I, I think that's true, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And, um, and very interesting, you know, as you're saying this, um, I love, I love hearing from the artist cause I, I didn't connect the dots about the figure at the end. So, um, so that's really interesting hearing that and also how it connects to the pre-Raphaelites because, you know, they did paint a lot of images of death actually. Mm. Um, there I'm thinking of Ophelia and, um, you know, one of the most famous paintings. And then also, um, Via Beatrix. Um, it's a painting that Rossetti did after his wife died. And it's like a vision of her. And, um, and it's a really beautiful, like, you can just feel like the love in his heart for her and um, just like emotion. And so they did, there was a lot of, they really painted the full spectrum of like the whole human experience. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, yeah, I think that this fits in, you know, really beautifully. And um, yeah, thank you, Zara. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, so um, this one right here, this is by Maria Cristina Jimenez. And Maria, are you here? Yes, I am. <laughs> Yay, share oh, with hi. us um, this story. <laughs> um, yes, well, I was inspired by a friend of mine. Um, she um, uh, transformed herself through being a mother, so sort of celebrating motherhood. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I would hear her stories because we work, we're coworkers. And I've learned from her stories about her daughter and what she's learning in terms of, of, of being a different person for her daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, so I felt like I was illuminated by her and I see she's illuminated. And, um, and I just wanted to celebrate her and how she's, nursing herself through her daughter and how she's nursing her daughter. So I wanted to show her breastfeeding um, bra straps um, and to show her face, which was kind of reminded me also of Rossetti. There's a painting called Sisterhood with the face is sort of turned and also Sargent. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to just um, use that as inspiration and also her nursing herself, nursing her daughter and just uh, transformation, just transforming her, herself to a different being. So, um, and I just want to talk a little bit about, um, I use Duralar, which is a little bit like Mylar, um, inspired by Alex Konevsky. He uses Mylar. So I just, um, it's a thinner, it's still archival, but um, uh, I like the, the, the smoothness of it. And um, um, yeah, that's what I want to say about that. <laughs> really beautiful, really beautiful portrait, Maria. Yeah. And um, yeah, I yeah. love it. And I was going to say, um, you, you talk about her being transformed through motherhood. And um, yeah. I've read several places that like psychologically and also physically, like we actually become a new person every seven years. Like the body like totally reproduces all of its cells, like every seven years, like there's no part of you that's like the same. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, psychologically, like the processes of our brain and stuff, like, especially if you go through a lot of new experiences, you really do become a different person. Like think of a baby to all the stages of life, you know? So um, really, really interesting. The- yeah, so it's physical. So she's changed physically, mentally, mm-hmm. spiritually, you know, now she's a much more spiritual person because of her child. Mm-hmm. So there's really a, a transformative experience uh, for her as becoming motherhood. And I'm seeing her and hearing her stories that it helps me, you know, think differently and um, try to be different because I teach high school with my own students. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was, uh, it was enlightening. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. But I want to thank you both, Carrie and you for including me in the show. <laughs> and yeah. um, I'm, I'm very honored to be a part of it. So thank you both. You're welcome. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. All right, and this is our last piece of the evening. This is called The Poppy Picker by Tara Chapman. And I actually have a, um, a little video that Tara shared with me. So I'm just gonna um, hold that up here. She is explaining her piece. Stop this share. And then 
share her video. Okay. All right, so here is Tara. Hi, my name is Tara Chapman, and this is my piece for Coffee Picker. And this particular piece was inspired by mostly dreams and dreaming. And also, one of my main themes of most of my pieces is my love of the Mediterranean, which especially this one has. It's based mostly off of Sicily, which is where my husband is from. So I spent a lot of time there. And I really love walking through the landscape, the colors of the sunset, lots of purples, lots of colors I really haven't seen very much before. And I just, I've always found the history of the, especially the Southern Mediterranean to be very inspiring. And so especially the moment right before nighttime, right as the sun is setting, maybe it's just set, things like that. It's just really dreamy and romantic and I find it very inspiring. And so this piece, it's a little bit of a representation of that. So I hope you enjoy and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. I know I have. All right, well, thanks for listening. Bye. Yay. So that was Tara's, um, that was Tara's piece. And um, yeah, we're gonna go back to the show here. So this is, that was the last piece. And um, just going out a little bit, um, Let's see here. Yeah. So that was the show, guys. Um, that is the entire show, over 40 pieces. This is the virtual gallery. Um, this is actually on the website, ericcontemporary.com. So if you want to, you can you can actually click into this and zoom around and like um, all of these are proportional to the scale of you know the size of the pieces. So you can zoom in and see all the details and you know, really zoom up close. So um, yeah, without, you know, having to have me do it. So you can definitely interact with all of these pieces. And um, I just want to thank all of the artists so much for being a part of this. Um, you guys are so inspiring. I feel very inspired right now. And um, I hope that you do uh, feel inspired as well by each other. And just as a reminder, um, for anyone who's interested in purchasing any of these pieces, you can do so at um, ericcontemporary.com. Just click the collect button at the top. Um, yeah, it's very obvious, it's right there. And um, you, can, you can check out all these pieces, they're all for sale. And um, tonight um, there is a special on them until midnight. So please take advantage of that if you're thinking of um, becoming a collector to any one of these fabulous pieces. I know, um, you know, it's very different than, you know, going to um, buy something at Target or something, you know, where the artist never knows that, you know, you, you are buying something. When, when, when you buy a piece of original art, you're buying a, a um, it's a, a part of that person's life, really. Um, and you, you really gain their spirit in your home when you, when you take in that art. And, um, so it's, it's very special, absolutely very special. And um, so consider that if you're thinking of being a collector, um, you've heard from all the artists tonight, which makes it really special. So thank you guys so much. And um, Kerry, did you wanna say anything before we close out the show? Um, one or two quick thoughts. Um, you know, I just wanna say I'm, I'm really proud of this show. Uh, yeah, it, it's um, even better than I, you know, I don't know what I was thinking when I went into it, but I'm very impressed. Um, and, you know, the word that just came to my mind, I mean, I, I, I want to say, can we do this every week? You know, because it's, I mean, it's I, like the word that's coming to my mind is sanctuary. You know, it's like, you know, when we go into our studios, it's like going into our sanctuaries. And, and, um, and that's kind of like what we're all sharing right now. It's like going to church. So, um, you know, I think it definitely feeds, you know, something, um, something in our spirits, uh, something in our souls. So, um, yeah, good job. I think, I think that collectively as a community, I think, I think this is pretty top notch. Awesome. Thank you, Carrie. Sure. And, um, I just have to also say something that's so funny that you say that word because the next, um, the next group show that, that I'm shooting for to be in spring is going to be called her sanctuary. I'm not even joking. So that's a perfect lead in. <laughs> Yeah, the next show is going to be called Her Sanctuary. So um, yeah, thank you so much, Carrie. You are an amazing curator and all of you guys are such an amazing artist. 
And thank you so much to all the collectors who, um, who have, you know, basically they, they make it possible, right? So um, without collectors, who, you know, who would we be making our art for? Um, and the, not only collectors, but like museums and people who appreciate it, um, you know, our art is for the world. So um, thank you for everyone interested enough to sit through two hours of talking about art in detail. So um, thank you guys so much. And um, check us out at ericcontemporary.com. If you have any questions, you can shoot um, an email to the gallery, ericcontemporary at gmail.com. And um, yeah, and thank you guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful night. And I hope that this show has been illuminating to you, to your life. You've gotten some, some wonderful illuminations, not just for arts, but also just for life in general. And, um, and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Great job. Bye.